The Java language was introduced in 1995, and it very quickly, within a few short years, became the most widely used language. It was created by Sun Microsystems, a hardware company most known for selling servers and workstations, and because Java originated as a corporate product, it has both a logo and a mascot. Java is an imperative language with a heavy emphasis on object-oriented programming. Like many languages, Java borrows much of its syntax from C. In fact, at first it's quite easy to look at pieces of Java code and mistake them for C. Also like C, Java is statically typed, though there is a caveat to this because there is an exception in the static typing system where there's an element of dynamicism. What exactly that means we'll cover shortly. Unlike C, Java doesn't have pointers. Java does have what are called references, but these are reference variables just like we saw in Pigeon. It's just a variable which holds the address of some object somewhere on the heap. But there's no referencing or dereferencing, and there's nothing like pointer arithmetic. And whereas C has pointers to pointers, and arrays of pointers and pointers to arrays, and there's this intimate connection between arrays and pointers, uh, there's nothing like that in Java. A reference is just a reference. You assign an object to it, and so the address of that object gets stored in the reference. End of story. As I briefly mentioned when we discussed languages, Java is actually both compiled and interpreted. First, the source code is compiled into what Java calls bytecode, and then this bytecode is run by the JVM, which is basically a kind of interpreter, though in this case the JVM will also do what's called JIT compiling, just-in-time compilation, which we also discussed. Like all interpreted languages, Java uses automatic garbage collection. So we, the programmers, the users of Java, just get to create our objects, and we don't really have to be too concerned about keeping track of them. They just automatically get disposed of when we're not using them anymore. We don't have to explicitly get rid of them. The last big difference between Java and C, I would say, is that Java has an exception mechanism. As we saw in JavaScript, exceptions help us do error handling in a more elegant way than we have to do, say, in C when we don't have exceptions. One last really notable difference between C and Java is that whereas C has a very minimal standard library, the standard library in Java is much more complete. For instance, the Java standard library includes an XML parser, and it also includes uh, stuff for doing GUIs, graphical user interfaces. For both of those purposes, you might choose to use some third-party library instead, but the standard ones are there if you want to use them. Because the standard library is so big, it actually comes in three different versions. You'll hear talk about Java SE, Standard Edition, Java EE, Enterprise Edition, and Java ME, Micro Edition. Standard Edition, as the name implies, is the default. It's the one that you generally have on a PC. The Enterprise Edition contains everything in the Standard Edition, but then it also includes a whole bunch of stuff having to do with creating uh, server software. In particular, it's geared towards large-scale networking, like, say, in a big corporation, hence the name Enterprise Edition. The Micro Edition is the standard edition with some stuff stripped out for the purpose of making it just smaller, because the Micro Edition is targeted for, say, small devices like cell phones. On those devices, you don't have a lot of storage space, you don't have as much memory, so it doesn't make it, uh, so much sense to have really big libraries hanging around if you're not going to use them. In truth, the Micro Edition doesn't make as much sense as it once did because uh, the devices it was intended for have gotten more powerful and now it makes sense on a lot of those devices like smartphones to just, if you want Java, just use the full SE. Since its original release in 1995, Java's gone through a few updates and the latest version is now called Java 6 that was released in 2006 and the next version, Java 7, uh, may appear sometime in late 2010 maybe a bit later. It actually is quite important to know this because when you do a web search for some piece of the Java standard library, you really want to include Java 6 in your search because otherwise it's probably going to show up as the first result, uh, the old version of the documentation for some previous version of Java. It's also worth mentioning that previous versions of Java aren't called as you would expect Java 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The first release of Java is called 1.0, the second was called 1.1, then 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4, but then very, very confusingly, uh, Sun decided they wanted to call Java 1.4, Java 2. And then when they released Java 5, they decided to call that both Java 2 1.5 and Java 2 5.0, which makes no sense whatsoever. 
Finally, they sort of fixed this mess with Java 6, though it, to be clear, although they called Java 5 often Java 5.0 or Java 2 5.0, Java 6 is not supposed to be known as Java 6.0. Rather, it's Java 1.6, and if you want to call it just by a single number, you call it Java 6. And similarly, Java 7 is going to be called either Java 7 or Java 1.7. Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever, but that's just what they decided. As an object-oriented language, the core concept in Java is what's called a class. A class is a data type definition very much like a struct in C is a data type definition. The key difference, though, is that classes are comprised of not just pieces of data, which are called the fields, but also functions, which are called methods in this context. So a class is essentially a blueprint for a composite piece of data, and these pieces of data are called objects or instances. When we create a new object, a new instance, we say we are instantiating a class. So here's a trivial example class, which is given the name Moose. Moose is defined to have two fields, R, which is of type rat, and H, which is of type hamster, and then it has one method called foo and the method foo takes no arguments and it returns void, it returns nothing. And of course in a real method you'd actually have lines of code, I'm just using ellipses to indicate that stuff goes here. There are a few things to note here. First, it's the convention in Java that all class names begin with a capital letter, so it's capital M moose, and it's capital R rat, and so forth. Also note the lack of a semicolon after the end curly brace. Uh, you may recall that struct definitions in C you put a semicolon at the end, whereas here in Java, to define a class, you never put a semicolon. It just ends with the curly brace. Finally, notice that I've put the fields up above the methods, and this isn't required at all. You can put all the stuff in a class in any order you want, but it's just good convention to put the fields first. Now, you are probably wondering about the relationship between methods and their class. It doesn't seem to really make sense. Well, the first thing to understand is that when you instantiate a class, when you create objects, say, of moose, each object doesn't have to have its own copy of the method foo. There's always just one copy of a method in memory, and it's shared among all the instances of the class. But there's a principled reason why we are combining functions with data types, where we are tying them together in one abstract entity called a class, and that principle is called encapsulation. The essence of encapsulation is that for any data type, you should have a set of methods which are the only things that are allowed to touch the components of those objects. This doesn't mean that methods that aren't in this set shouldn't at all handle objects of this type. It means that if they want to read or manipulate the fields of that object, they should use the methods of that object to do so for them. They shouldn't do it themselves directly. In effect, an object becomes a module where only its methods know what's really going on inside, and as far as everything else is concerned, they use the object's methods as a simplified interface for their dealings with that object. Just like when getting the members of a struct in C to get the field of an object in Java, we use the dot operator. And so we write object.field, where object is an expression evaluating into an object, and field is an identifier, it's the name of the field. We also use the dot operator when we wish to invoke a method, because we can't just call a method by itself, we have to invoke it via a particular object of its type, of its class. And so we write object.method, where object is an expression evaluating into the object, and method is an identifier specifying which method of the class, and then afterwards in parentheses we put the list of arguments, and the arguments are separated by commas, just like in C. So here, for example, apple.banana. Apple should be a variable holding an object, and that object should have a field named banana, and this whole expression, apple.banana, returns the value of that field. Here, apple.banana.orange, what's happening is that the dot operator is left to write associative. So first we get the field banana of the object apple, and then from that field banana, which is an object itself, we get the field orange. And so this whole expression evaluates into the value of that field, orange. Here, nadine.ed, with parentheses, this is uh, invoking the method ed of the object nadine 
and it's an empty argument list, so no arguments are being passed to the method. Here now, again, we're invoking the method ed of the object Nadine, and we're passing no arguments, but then the object returned by that method, we are getting its field, Laura. And here it's the same deal, except once we get back the object in the field, Laura, we are invoking its method called Dale, and again, we're passing no arguments. It can be a bit tricky to catch on to this chained dot operator syntax, so here's all the same expressions except with explicit parentheses to denote the precedence. Variable declarations in Java have the same basic syntax as they do in C. First we just put the type, and then space, and then we choose a name, and we end with a semicolon. So here, for example, we're declaring a variable named m, which is of type moose. Now a very key thing to understand is that we are not creating a moose object. This is just creating a reference variable. m can be assigned the address of any moose object. Actual moose objects, like all objects in Java, all instances, live on the heap. Never in Java do you have an object itself living on the stack. It's only references to objects that go on the stack. And when we declared the moose type to have two fields, one of type rat and one of type hamster, those two fields are themselves just references. So the moose object is somewhere on the heap, but that object consists of just two references to other objects elsewhere on the heap. Now when we create a variable like this without giving it an initial value, it has the default initial value of null. So right now m references nothing. To assign m a moose object, we first need to create one, and we create objects with the new operator. We write new, and then we write the type, and then surprisingly afterwards we put a list of arguments. In this case, the way we define the class moose, it doesn't take any arguments when we instantiate it. So here we're just going to write m equals new moose and then no arguments. This creates a new moose object and assigns it to the reference m. And of course, we can combine these two statements into one. In our declaration of m, we can assign it an initial value. So why would you ever supply arguments when you instantiate a class? Well, the answer is that classes can have special methods called constructors. A constructor, quite simply, is a method which is invoked at instantiation time. The purpose of a constructor is to set up an object, to do whatever is necessary to put that object in a proper initial state what counts as a proper initial state depends entirely on the class. You may find that in smaller classes you really don't want to do any setup work whatsoever, so you don't really want to include a constructor. And in fact, if you don't include a constructor in your class, Java will automatically include what it calls the default constructor, which is basically a constructor that does nothing and takes no arguments. But if you do want to define your own constructor for the class, to do so, you write it just like a method, except the name has to match the class name, and you don't declare a return type, because the return type, obviously, is the class type itself. So here, for example, is a constructor for the class moose, and this constructor takes no arguments, and I've alighted over whatever business it might do. A very common thing to do in a constructor is to assign the initial values of the fields. So here in this moose constructor, I'm creating a new rat and assigning it to the field r, and then I'm creating a new hamster and assigning it to the field h. Inside any constructor or method, the reserved word this is a special reference that references the object itself. So each time the moose constructor is invoked, this refers to the object being constructed, the new moose object. And so when we assign to this.r, we are assigning to the field r of that new moose object. Another common thing to do with constructors is to have the default values for the fields come from parameters to the constructor. So here we're defining the moose constructor to take one parameter of type hamster and one parameter of type rat and then assigning them to the appropriate fields. So when we create a new moose object with this constructor we would supply first the hamster object as the first argument and then a rat object as the second. There's actually quite a bit more to say about constructors, but we'll come back to them later. Inheritance in object-oriented programming refers to a mechanism whereby one data type, one class, uh, gets all the members from some other class from which it inherits.
So for example, say we have three classes, animal, mammal, and cat. An animal inside that class, we have defined three members, A, B, and C. We don't care which ones are fields and which are methods in this context, just three members. And mammal has two members, D and E, and cat has two members, F and G. Well, if mammal inherits from animal, then in addition to D and E defined in mammal, it also implicitly has the members that were defined in animal, so it has A, B, and C as well. And cat, if it inherits from mammal, then it gets everything that mammal has. It gets both D and E defined in mammal and everything that mammal itself inherited. So cat ends up with all of them, D, E, A, B, and C. So when we instantiate cat, if E is a field, then every cat object is going to have its own field named E. And if, say, B is a method, then every cat object we can invoke the method B on that object. So to sum it up plainly, a class that inherits from another has everything defined in itself plus everything from that other class. In some object-oriented languages, like say C++, a class can inherit from multiple other classes. Uh, this gets very confusing very fast because it involves all sorts of complex rules about like what if both classes have members of the same name and all sorts of really uh, picky little rules like that. So Java simplifies things and says that a class can only inherit from one other class. And in fact, Java requires every class to inherit from another. The only exception is that there's a special built-in class called object, which is at the top of the hierarchy. And uh, it, of course, doesn't inherit from anything. So effectively, any Java program is a hierarchy of classes with object at the top and every other class inheriting from one other. Here, for instance, Kate inherits from Ted, which in turn inherits from Jack, which in turn inherits from Object, and then we have Oliver inheriting from Brad, which inherits from Samantha, which inherits from Object, and Lisa and Milton both also inherit from Samantha. When talking about these relationships between classes, uh, there's a lot of different terms. Uh, if Kate inherits from Ted, then Kate is said to be a child of Ted, or a subclass of Ted, or a descendant of Ted and Ted is said to be the parent of Kate, or the superclass of Kate, or an ancestor of Kate. Whereas parent and superclass refers to the class that's immediately above another class in the hierarchy, and subclass and child class refers to one immediately below, ancestor refers to any class up the chain, and descendant refers to any class down the chain. So here, Jack is an ancestor of Kate, and Kate is a descendant of Jack. So the way we express these inheritance relationships in code is that every time we define a class, we specify what class it inherits from, and we do so with what's called the extends clause. So here we have two classes, Terry and John, and John extends the class Ben. So Ben is the parent of John, John is the child of Ben. Terry has no extends clause, so by default uh, it extends the object class. We could explicitly write here extends object, but if you leave it out, it just automatically is assumed to be a child of object. Now, one thing you certainly can't do is have circular inheritance. You can't have a situation where the arrows of inheritance end up pointing back at some class. That doesn't make sense. It's not even clear what this would even mean if it were allowed. No, so you have to have a proper uh, tree-like hierarchy that ultimately points back up to object. If you try to write something like this, the compiler will object. Probably the most important thing to understand about inheritance, besides the uh, base level understanding of what it does, is that you should understand when to use inheritance and when not to. The general guideline is to try to make a distinction between an is a relationship and a has a relationship. When two classes have a proper inheritance relationship, an object of one class is a valid kind of object of the other class. That is, it is a proper substitute because it has everything that class has, it just has more stuff. So for example, it's proper for the class mammal to inherit from animal because a mammal is an animal. A mammal is just a more specific kind of animal. And so every mammal has everything an animal does, it just has more stuff, it has more specific stuff. Similarly, it's proper to have cat inherit from mammal because a cat is a valid kind of mammal. In contrast, if we have two classes, bicycle and wheel, it doesn't make sense for wheel to inherit from bicycle or the other way around. The proper relationship in that case is that a bicycle is a thing which has a wheel, 
or two wheels in this case. So the bicycle class should have a field that contains a wheel or two wheels. A wheel is not a valid kind of bicycle, it's a component of a bicycle. The classic mistake made by people new to object-oriented programming is that they overuse inheritance. In particular, they end up trying to use inheritance when they should be using just composition. A bicycle is composed of a wheel or two wheels, so it has one or two wheel fields. That's composition. Inheritance, for some reason, tends to be like the hammer that makes everything look like a nail. It's really useful when you actually need it, but you shouldn't feel any obligation to use it in your programs. In fact, in most small to medium sized programs, it's quite possible you won't use any inheritance whatsoever. Or rather, all the classes that you create will just extend object rather than extend from each other. When inheritance is used in smaller programs, it's more likely that rather than inheriting one of your classes from another, you will define a class which inherits from a class in the standard library, because that's how they're designed to be used. Some classes are designed to be extended from, and that's what you're supposed to do with them. Even if you do end up using inheritance among your own classes, you should understand that it's generally a bad idea to have deep levels of inheritance. That is, if you were to diagram the tree of classes, you won't see many uh, chains that go down more than about three or four levels. So if you end up with classes that have like 10 or 20 ancestors, you're probably doing something wrong. Now, if you look in the standard library and some third-party Java libraries, you may find that there are examples of inheritance hierarchies that go down about six or seven levels. It's not necessarily what you want to imitate in your own code. You know, library code is its own special case. It has different design requirements than most other code. It typically has to be much more general and flexible, and this leads sometimes to some rather elaborate class hierarchies. I strongly advise you not to take your cues from such examples. The fact that a class has all of the features of its ancestors plus just more stuff has a very important consequence, and that is that as far as the compiler is concerned, a objects of a class are suitable substitutes for objects of their ancestor classes. So any place the compiler expects an object of type X, we can instead put any descendant of X. So for example, assume that hamster is a descendant of mammal. Well then, if we create a hamster object, we can assign it to not just a hamster reference as we do here, the reference H, but we can also assign the, the very same object to a reference of type mammal, to M because as far as the compiler is concerned, a hamster is a valid kind of mammal. The subtle part here is that Java doesn't presume to know what's actually going to happen to the reference mammal at runtime. Here it's very clear that we're assigning it a hamster object, but as far as the compiler is concerned, M is still a mammal, not a hamster. So if the hamster class has a method called run on wheel, but mammal does not, it's okay to write h.runonWheel because h is a hamster reference and therefore the compiler sees it's okay. Yes, the hamster type has such a method. But then even though the m reference is also holding the hamster object, we can't write m.runonWheel because run on wheel is not a valid method of the mammal class. Mammal class doesn't include it. As far as the compiler is concerned, M is just a mammal, and whether it's a more specific kind of mammal, it doesn't presume to know. And so to be consistent with static typing, it can only allow you to use the fields and methods which belong to the mammal class, not to any descendant class. One way to think of this is we can distinguish between the compile time type of an expression and the runtime type of the expression. The compile time type of m here in m.runonWheel is always going to be mammal, but because there's always a potential at runtime that we might assign any kind of mammal to a mammal reference, the actual type, the runtime type, could be something else. It could be hamster. This use of subtypes in place of their ancestors works also in function calls, like say here, where we have a method called bar that returns void but expects a parameter of type mammal. Well, then we can pass it either a mammal object or we can pass it a hamster object because a hamster is a type of mammal. And similarly, if we have a method here, foo, which returns mammal, then we can return either a mammal or we can return a, a hamster. We can return anything which is considered a mammal, so that includes mammal itself or any subtype thereof. Recall from C casting, where we take a value and convert it into another type and we did this with the type name we want to convert to in parentheses placed in front of the expression of the value. 
In the previous slides, we've actually been doing what Java considers to be a kind of cast. Specifically, it's what it calls upcasting. We're taking objects of one type and casting them up the chain of inheritance to some other type. So say, when we assign a hamster object to a mammal reference, we're actually casting it to mammal first. Now, whereas casting is usually thought of as a kind of conversion of a value, in this case, nothing's really happening to the object, nor is there really a new object being produced. It's just that for the sake of satisfying the compiler, we're telling it, yes, this hamster object is a valid kind of mammal. And with upcasting, actually, as we saw in the previous slides, you don't actually have to do it explicitly. If you just leave out the cast, uh, Java will assume it's there. We can just leave upcasts implicit. In contrast, if we want to cast down the chain of inheritance, if we want to take, say, this mammal expression and tell the compiler that it's really a hamster, we have to make the cast explicit, otherwise the compiler will balk. The reason for this double standard is that when you do an upcast, uh, the compiler knows for sure that a hamster is always a valid kind of mammal. What the compiler doesn't know here, though, is whether the expression m, a mammal reference, is actually at runtime going to hold a hamster. As far as the compiler can see, m here might at runtime be holding a proper mammal object, or it might be holding some other subtype of mammal which is not related to hamster. Because of branching, it's quite possible that the compiler, even if it put the effort to try and figure out what m at this point is going to hold, it might be actually be indeterminate, because it might, say, rely on uh, user interaction or something else from outside the program. So even in the cases where the compiler could figure out for sure that, yes, this is going to be a hamster, it doesn't bother. And so the compiler doesn't presume to know whether, at runtime, this mammal reference is going to be holding a hamster or not. Instead, what happens when this downcast is reached is that the runtime performs a type check, and if the object in M is not a valid kind of hamster, then the language is going to throw an exception. So, whereas an upcast represents no kind of runtime action at all, it's purely just satisfying the compiler, a downcast is not just satisfying a compiler. We're not just telling the compiler that, hey, this mammal reference is okay to assign to a hamster reference. It also represents an actual type check at runtime because what we don't want at runtime is for our hamster reference to end up with something assigned to it which is not actually a hamster. So when we write this code as programmers, we're telling the compiler, yes, we expect M to be a hamster, but we might have made a mistake because of branching. It might end up that M is going to be something other than a hamster. And that's why Java requires downcasts to be explicit, because they actually represent sort of dangerous operations. They're something we, we might screw up. And so it makes sense to effectively ask the programmer, are you sure you really want to do this? Finally, it's only possible to upcast or downcast objects. There's no such thing as, say, sidecasting, where you convert from one type to a totally unrelated type. Like, say, if you have a class duck and lamp, and presumably duck and lamp are totally unrelated, well then, it's just not valid to cast a duck into a lamp. Under no circumstance is a duck a valid kind of lamp. A key feature of inheritance in Java is that Java allows us to override methods. When a class overrides a method, it basically means that it redefines that method. So for example, in this class hierarchy, Jack has a method called foo, which takes no arguments and returns void. Well, if in Lisa we also define a method named foo that takes no arguments and returns void, then Lisa overrides foo. Now, it's perfectly legal in this overridden foo to do something entirely different from whatever is done in the version in Jack, but generally the idea with overriding methods is that the override should do basically the same thing, but something more appropriate, more specific to this subtype. So for example, if a mammal has an eat method, then a hamster might also have an eat method because hamsters eat in their own particular way. In any case, the important question is, how do you know which version of this method is being called? Is it the one in Jack being invoked, or is it the one in Lisa? Well, say we have a TED reference, T, and then at some point we assign T an actual object, and then we're going to invoke T.foo. So the question is, which version of foo are we invoking? Well, this depends upon the runtime type of T. What's the actual object being held in T at the time of this invocation? If T holds a TED object, then this is going to invoke the foo defined in Jack. But if T holds a Lisa, Kate, or Mike object, then it's going to invoke the foo defined in Lisa.
if we have a k reference k and then at some point we assign some object to k and then invoke k.foo, well the rule is still that it matters what kind of actual object at runtime is being held in kate, but because a kate reference is always going to hold either a kate or a mic object, in this case we know that it's always going to invoke the foo defined in Lisa, because kate and mic both inherit the foo defined in Lisa. So be clear about the role of the compiler and the runtime in this scenario. The compiler looks at the compile time type of the object and then the name of the method and the arguments provided to it and determines whether it's a valid method call. But if a method is overridden, it's left till runtime to decide which actual version is being invoked, and that depends on the type of the actual object. Recall that at the beginning I said Java is mostly a static language, but with some elements of dynamicism. Well, this is what I was talking about. This is an example of runtime polymorphism. When we invoke a method, the actual method being invoked can depend upon the actual type of the object, and the actual type isn't determined until runtime. In fact, that Java allows us to assign different types to a reference is itself an element of dynamicism. The fact that our TED reference T might hold something other than exactly a TED object, that violates strict static typing. So Java isn't entirely static. Another scenario in which we want to get around the strictures of strict static typing is something like this. Say we have two unrelated classes, Nick and Diane. They're unrelated in the sense that Nick doesn't inherit from Diane and Diane doesn't inherit from Nick, though of course they do have the common ancestor object. And say both of these classes have a method of the same name with the same arguments and the same return type. And what we want to be able to do is hold these two unrelated objects in a common reference so we can invoke this method they both share in such a way that which method is invoked depends upon the type of the object at runtime. So for example, we'll have a reference x to which we might assign a Nick or a Diane object, and then when we invoke x.foo, which foo gets invoked at runtime should depend upon whether x is holding a Nick object or a Diane object. The problem is that x needs to be of a type that can hold both a Nick or a Diane object. So you might say we should make x of type capital O object. This would allow us to assign either a Nick or a Diane to x. The problem is that we can't invoke foo on x. x's compile time type is object. The object class doesn't have any such method foo, so the compiler doesn't allow this. Even if we write our code in such a way that x is only going to possibly be holding a Nick or a Diane object and both of those have a foo method, well, the compiler doesn't even try to figure that out, so it doesn't presume to know whether that's true or not. So as far as it's concerned, foo is not a valid method to invoke via the reference x. The solution to this problem is to create what Java calls an interface. An interface is simply a list of methods, but those methods don't have any actual code in them. So here we have an interface named philip with just one method defined in it, foo, but rather than defining an actual body for this method, we just put a semicolon instead of a pair of curly braces. Once we create an interface, we can declare that a class implements an interface. When a class implements an interface, it is required to have a definition for each one of the methods listed in the interface. So Nick and Diane must both implement a method foo that takes no parameters and returns void. If they didn't, the compiler would complain that they don't properly implement philip. You can think of an interface as like a contract that imposes upon any class that implements it a requirement to have that set of methods. The gain from this is that an interface acts like a type definition. We can't instantiate any philip objects, but actually Diane and Nick, because they both implement philip, then their objects are considered to be valid kinds of philip objects. So what we can do now is create a reference of type philip, and then we can assign any object of a class which implements philip to this reference, and then invoke the methods defined in philip via that reference. Now when we write x.foo, this is legal because x is of type philip, and philip is declared to have such a method foo. Which version gets invoked here, of course, depends upon the type of the actual object held in x at the time of the call. Understand, though, that because the compiler sees x as of type philip,
then the only thing we can get at via this reference are the methods listed in the interface Philip. If Nick and Dan happen to have some other methods in common, but those methods aren't listed in Philip, then we can't use x to get at them. And as for fields, well, an interface never includes fields, so you never get at fields via a reference to, of an interface type. Finally, when a class implements an interface, all of the descendants of that class are considered to also implement the interface. So here, if Nick has a subclass Ian, well then Ian is considered a valid kind of Philip object. So if we summarized how method invocations work at this point, we'd say that the compiler's role is to look at the compile time type of the object and determine if that method with those arguments actually exists for that type. But because the actual type of the object is not known, it's not determined until runtime which actual method to invoke. Because the compile time type and the actual type at runtime may differ, it's not determined until the method is actually called which version of that method is going to be invoked. And then also, as we just described, the compile time type might be an interface type, and so the actual type at runtime might be any object which implements that interface. This sums up the rules as I've laid them out so far, but there's actually another rule. When we invoke a method via the special this reference, it doesn't matter what the actual type is. An invocation via this always invokes the method which belongs to that class. So for example, in the class cat inside a method or constructor, you invoke this.foo. The foo invoked is going to be the one defined in cat itself, or if cat doesn't define its own version of foo, it's going to be the one inherited by cat. What's not going to happen is that this.foo invokes foo from a subclass of cat. And this is the case even if the special reference this is referencing a subclass of cat rather than an instance of cat itself. So say we have a class Mary and a class Leo which inherits from Mary. Defined in Mary are the methods foo and bar, and inside Leo we override foo. And let's say the definition for bar in Mary looks like this. Bar doesn't return anything, it doesn't take any arguments, all it does is it invokes the method foo via the special this reference. So if elsewhere in code we create a Leo object and then we invoke via that object the method bar, because remember Leo inherits bar from Mary, well in that call to bar the special reference this is referencing a Leo object, not a Mary object. But because of the special rule this.foo is not going to invoke foo that's overridden in Leo, it's going to invoke the foo of Mary. As this demonstrates, this special rule about this means that when we override a method, the version we're replacing doesn't necessarily have no bearing whatsoever on a subclass that overrides that method. In fact, whereas in this case we're invoking the overridden method from the ancestor indirectly, there's a way to invoke these overridden methods directly. Hence our fourth rule about method invocations. When you invoke a method via the reserved word super, you are invoking the inherited version of that method the version inherited by the current class. So for example, say we have two classes, Ryan and Heather, which inherits from Ryan. And let's say Ryan has a method foo, and Heather overrides foo, and has another method ack. And within ack, we simply invoke super.foo. When we then create a Heather object and assign it to h, and invoke h.ack, well then within ack, super is a reference to the Heather object, but because we use super, this doesn't invoke the foo of Heather, it invokes the foo that Heather overrides. It invokes the foo in Ryan. The most common reason to use super is that when we override a method, we usually want to still do everything that the overridden method does, we just want to do more. And so very commonly when we override a method, within that method we'll be invoking the overridden version. And to do so we have to use super. Now, while I said that super is like the reference this, and that you can think of it as holding a reference to the current object, that is the object via which this method was invoked, but this isn't really accurate. In the case of this, we really can treat it as a reference, so here we're using this as an argument to another method. The only thing we can't do with this is assign to it. Within a method call, this is effectively constant, it always refers to the same object. 
In contrast, we can't treat super like just another reference, so say we can't pass it as an argument to another method. When you use super, you're always going to use it immediately followed by the dot operator. Java's type system is actually split into two branches. There's classes and interfaces, which are called reference types, and then there are what are called the primitive types. The eight primitive types are very similar to the base types in C, and many of them in fact have the same name, though they're not always exactly the same. So for example, in Java, an int is a 4-byte signed integer, and it's always a 4-byte signed integer. There's no such thing as an unsigned int, and this definition of int does not vary depending upon the platform the way it does in C. Whereas a char in C is a single byte integer, in Java it's always a two byte integer and it's always unsigned. This is because when Java was created, Unicode was beginning to take over the world, and at the time the most popular encoding, and the one used by Java predominantly, was uh, what's called UCS2, which uses two bytes per character. In truth, this was a bit of a screw-up because, as you know, uh, not all Unicode characters can be encoded into two bytes. So when dealing with Unicode text in Java, you can't necessarily just put any character into a char. Still, a char is what's most commonly used when you want to store a single character. One other major difference from C is that Java has a proper explicit Boolean type. Rather than using the value 0 to represent false and all other numeric values to represent true, in Java we have an actual value called true and an actual value called false, and those are the two Boolean values. In fact, in the condition of an if statement or a while statement, the condition expression must evaluate into Boolean. It can't evaluate into, say, an int or a byte or any other kind of numeric value. It has to be a proper Boolean. So these are the types we most commonly use when we deal with numbers, but the question is what if you need arbitrary precision? Like say, what if double precision floating point isn't accurate enough or doesn't have a big enough range? Well, for such purposes, there are some classes in the standard library called big decimal and big integer, which can represent respectively uh, arbitrarily sized decimal numbers and arbitrarily sized integers. When you use these classes, though, because they are reference types and not primitive types, you can't use the standard operators. Like, say, you can't use a plus sign to add one big integer to another big integer. You have to invoke on the big integer object uh, the method called add and pass to it the other big integer object. So it, it ends up looking really clumsy and doesn't look like math at all. In truth, though, as I've discussed before, it's actually really quite rare in programming that we really truly need arbitrary precision and arbitrary magnitude numbers. It just doesn't come up very often except in a few domains. Like say in code having to do with financial stuff, that is a case where you'll want to use big decimal because it's not acceptable to get any rounding error the way you usually get when you use floating point numbers. In the large majority of programming though, these primitive types serve us just fine. There are a few critical differences between the primitive types and what are called the reference types, which includes classes and interfaces. When we declare a variable which has the type of a reference type, that variable is a reference variable. It holds a reference, an address. The actual objects themselves are located somewhere else on the heap. A reference variable just holds the address of where that object is located. In contrast, a variable which is a primitive type is a value variable. It holds the value itself in the variable. So if we declare a variable int i and assign it a value, that value is stored directly in i. We don't store the address of that value, we store the value itself directly in the variable. Another major difference is that when you use the equality operator with reference types, what you are actually testing is identity. So if we have two references, x and y, and we use the equality operator with them, what we are actually asking is, does the reference x and the reference y, do they point to the very same object in memory? If x points to one object and y points to another, it doesn't matter for the purpose of this test what they look like in memory. They could both look exactly the same in memory, but they're still two separate objects, so an identity test in this case would return false. In contrast, when we use the equality operator on primitive types, 
it's actually testing for equality. So if we use the equality operator with two int variables a and b, we'll get back true as long as their values are equivalent. So in fact, a and b don't even have to be the same type. One, say, can be an int, and the other could be, say, a float. If the int value is 3 and the float value is 3.0, well, those are equivalent, so the equality test would return true. Finally, when we cast reference types, we're either doing an upcast or a downcast, and neither of these kinds of casts really convert the value in any sense. It's just that we are satisfying the compiler and telling it that, yes, this object is a suitable stand-in for this type. In contrast, when we cast a primitive type, it's much more like a cast in C. You can think of the cast as actually producing a new value. So consider this example, where we've declared an int variable named i, and assigned at the initial value 60, and we've declared a float variable named f, and assigned at the initial value 5.4. Well, if we want to assign the value of f to i, we first have to cast it into an int. And you should think of this as an operation. We are taking f and applying it the cast to int operator, and getting back a new int value, which is then assigned to i. And in this particular case, the cast produces a distortion because 5.4 isn't a valid int value, so it has to be truncated to an integer. So the cast to int here actually returns the value 5. In the next line, it's the same idea going the other way. To assign the value of i to f, we have to cast from an int to a float. So here the cast operation returns the value 5.0, and that's what gets assigned to f. Now there are some cases where the cast from one primitive type to another can be left implicit. We don't have to explicitly write the cast. These implicit casts are allowed in the cases where the cast couldn't possibly distort the value. So say, if we have an int variable i with the initial value 5, and a byte variable b with the initial value 3, well, if we want to assign the value of i to b, we have to explicitly cast to a byte. But conversely, if we want to assign the value of b to i, we don't. The reason for this double standard is that all possible byte values are all valid int values, but not all int values are valid byte values. A byte in Java is just a single signed integer, so it has the values from negative 128 to positive 127. An int is a 4-byte signed integer, so it has the value of negative 2 billion something up to positive 2 billion something. And so most int values we can't accurately store in a byte. We have to do some kind of violence to the value to make it fit. And in fact, what Java will do when you cast an int to a byte is that it will simply truncate. It will hack off the front three bytes out of the four, and the value of that remaining byte is what gets returned by the cast to type byte. Again, you may notice here that the compiler is being lazy, because any human can look at this code and say that, ah, i has the value 5 when this cast is done, therefore it is going to be a valid byte value. No violence is going to be done to the value. So a really smart compiler could look at this code and say, there's no possibility of violence to the value when we cast it to a byte, so therefore I'm not going to require you to make the cast explicit. But the compiler doesn't do that kind of analysis, and for good reason. It's very expensive to do, and it only works in basically trivial cases, because in real code you have branches, and the branching might depend upon something that happens at runtime, uh, something which simply can't be determined ahead of time at compile time. So it would just be a waste of energy on the compiler's part, and not really much help if it tried to figure these cases out for you. It would be a lot of effort for just a very trivial gain. A field or method in Java can be declared to be static. Static in this context has nothing to do with static typing, nor is this use of static like the use of static in C. In Java, static has a totally different meaning. In Java, when a field is declared static, the instances of its class do not each have their own instance of that field. So here, for example, in the class Ian, we have a static field f of type Fran. Well, when we instantiate Ian, each Ian object doesn't have its own field f. The truth is that the field f is really just a global variable, and is a global variable which we happened to put inside the class Ian. 
The only real relationship between this global variable and the class is that the class effectively acts as a namespace. So when we want to refer to this global variable, we refer to it as ian.f. Similarly, a static method is really not a method at all. It's not really a part of the class. Consequently, you can't invoke this method via an instance. That doesn't make any sense. And inside the method, you can't use this, because there is no object on which the method was invoked. So in truth, a static method is just a plain old function, and its only relationship to the class is that the class acts as its namespace. So here, if the class Ian has a static method named foo, well, to invoke foo, we would write ian.foo. In a way, static fields and static methods in Java are really kind of a cheat. Java is supposed to be a very object-oriented language, but any time you deal with global variables and plain functions rather than methods, you're not really programming in an object-oriented style. Still, it is good that Java has static fields and methods, because not all problems neatly fit into the object-oriented mold. It's sometimes nice if we can fall back on a procedural way of doing things. Now unfortunately with statics, Java allows something which is not only superfluous, but stupidly confusing to newbies. Here in this code, it appears that we are invoking the static method foo via an instance i, and that we are accessing the static field f via the instance i. But what's actually happening here is that the compiler merely looks at the compile time type of i and determines that yes, that type has a static method foo, and so we can invoke it. It's really just an alternative to writing ian.foo, and the invocation here has nothing to do with the instance of ian. It's really just a plain old call to the static method. And the assignment to f, again, has nothing to do with the instance. We're just assigning to the global variable, and there's only one global variable no matter how many instances of ian we have. It's just as a convenience, a misguided convenience, I believe, that Java allows us to refer to a static using any object expression that has the right compile time type. In my opinion, there's no reason you should ever do this, so I would always write ian.foo and ian.f. I think allowing static methods to be invoked this way is particularly confusing because it raises the question of does it matter what the actual type at runtime in i is? Because methods can be overridden, and so with instance methods, with non-static methods, it really does matter what is in i. But with static methods, the runtime type never matters. All that matters is the compile time type of the object expression. And so here, because the compile time type of i is ian, this invocation is always going to invoke the static of ian, even if a subclass of ian has overridden foo. That's never going to matter here, because static methods just don't work that way. In fact, I would say that the proper way to think about overriding of static methods is that the override is really just a totally separate function. They really have no relationship with each other, they just happen to share the same name. And so now we actually have a fifth rule of how methods are invoked. When a static method is invoked, which version gets called depends solely on what the compile time type of the object expression is. Again, not that you should rely on this rule. You should always explicitly invoke statics via their class name. Every reference type, every class and every interface, is placed in a namespace called a package. At the top of every file of source code, you put a package statement that declares that all the classes and all the interfaces in this file belong to this package. So, for example, if at the top of a file you have the line package shark, then all of the classes and all of the interfaces in that file are placed in the package of that name, shark. Package names by convention begin with lowercase letters, and they conform to all the rules of identifiers, except package names can include dots in the middle. So, say, you might have a package named pig.tiger. In truth, though, when you use dots in a package name, Java considers it actually to be a sub-package. So here this is actually tiger, the sub-package of pig. However, the term sub-package is misleading because there's nothing really special going on here. The classes that you place in pig.tiger have really no necessary relationship with anything you put in the package pig. In fact, if you put stuff in the package pig.tiger, you don't even have to have anything in a package named pig. At most, you should think of these sub-packages like subdirectories.
when a directory contains another directory, the files in that subdirectory have no necessary relationship with the stuff in the outer directory, though of course how you organize your files into directories and subdirectories should be logical. Well, of course, the same applies to packages. How you organize your classes and interfaces into packages should be logical. Now, say we're writing code in a source file, which is declared to use the package pig.tiger. So all the classes and the interfaces defined in that file are going to become a part of that package pig.tiger. Well, when writing code in this file, if we wish to make use of classes and interfaces from some other package, something other than pig.tiger, we have to fully qualify their names with the package name. So, for example, if the class ant is defined in the package shark, well then we can't just refer to ant simply by the name ant, we have to refer to it as shark.ant. Then conversely, when in a file declared to be part of the package shark, we don't have to qualify ant by its package name, but we do have to qualify the name of any class or interface which doesn't belong to shark. So say anytime we need to use the name of the class cow, which is defined in the package pig.tiger, we have to write pig.tiger.cow. We can't just write cow. Having to always fully qualify any class or interface from other packages gets obnoxious quite quickly. Not only does it require us to type more, it just makes the code end up looking really ugly and verbose. So, at the top of any source file, after the package statement, you can include any number of import statements. So here we're importing the classes pig.tiger.cow and pig.tiger.lemur. These statements don't represent any sort of runtime action, it's just telling the compiler that in this file, this class or interface name from some other package doesn't have to be qualified. So now in this file we can just write lemur to refer to the class lemur from pig.tiger and we can write just cow to refer to the class cow from the package pig.tiger. The general practice is to always try and avoid qualifying names and so we just import whenever we can. The only reason not to import is that you might have a name conflict, like say if the package shark had its own class named cow then importing the class cow from another package creates a name collision. If shark does have its own class cow, then cow here is going to refer to shark.cow. The compiler is simply going to ignore the imports of pig.tiger.cow, so to use that class, we'd have to qualify it with its package name. The most essential classes in the Java standard library are included in a package called java.lang. Lang here is short for language. Because these classes are special and used so frequently, all of the stuff in java.lang is automatically imported, so you never need to explicitly import them. The most important class in java.lang is object. This is the class which is always at the top of the class hierarchy. Object has several methods defined in it, and so every class is going to inherit these methods, but we're not going to discuss these methods until later. Another important class in java.lang is the string class. Every string in Java is an instance of this class. So for example, if we have a string literal, such as here we have the string reading hello, and we wish to assign it to a variable, well we have to assign it to a string reference. The string class includes several dozen methods, including one called length, which returns the number of characters in the string as an int value. So when we invoke length on the string, it'll return 5, because that's the number of characters. The remaining string methods do various manipulations that you often want to do with strings. To give one example, the method to uppercase will return a string which has all the same characters, except any lowercase character gets converted to uppercase. Now be very clear that this method does not modify the existing string object, it produces a new one. In fact, none of the methods in string will ever modify a string object, they only produce new strings. So effectively in Java, strings are always immutable, they can't change. In addition to all the methods of string, the plus sign operator is defined to concatenate strings. When the operands to the plus sign are numbers, it of course performs addition, but when one or both of the operands are strings, then the plus sign will produce a new string, which is a concatenation of its two operands. So if we have this plus sign with two operands, a string reading hello, comma, space, and another string reading ron, 
then what this operation produces is a new string that combines them into one. In the next example, only one of the operands is a string, so the other operand gets converted to a string and then concatenated with the other, and so the operation returns a single string in which they're joined together. So the class object and the class string are two important classes in the package java.lang. java.lang includes a few dozen others, some of which we'll discuss later. Every interface, every class, every field, and every method in Java has a visibility level. The visibility level of a thing determines where in the source code of a program it is allowed to be used. So for example, say we are writing code where the class cat is not visible. Well, what that means is we can't write any code there that requires using the name of that class. So for example, we couldn't declare a reference variable of type cat because that would require using the class name cat. What the lack of visibility does not mean is that it's totally impossible in that place to handle objects of type cat. Say we invoke some method which returns a cat object. But well, what we can't do is assign the cat object to a cat reference, because we can't create cat references, but a cat is a valid kind of object, so we can create a reference of type object and assign the cat to that reference. With fields and methods, it's the same idea. If, in a place where you're writing code, some field is not visible, then you can't refer to that field by name. This doesn't mean that there's a magic force field such that in this location we can't do anything that would possibly affect that field or that would possibly get back its value. No, that's not what happens. Even if the field is not visible, it's possible, say, another method of its class will return the value of that field for us, or, say, will set the value of that field for us. So we can interact with the field indirectly. We just can't do anything that uses its name. So a key idea here is that this visibility restriction is enforced entirely by the compiler. Once your code is compiled and running, the language runtime has no concept of this visibility. Every time we declare a field or method, we give it one of four different access levels. These are called public, protected, default, and private. To declare a member to be either public, protected, or private, you proceed it with one of these three reserved words. A field or method not preceded by one of these three words has default visibility. As for classes and interfaces, they can only be either public or default. They can't be protected or private. So every class and interface is going to have either public visibility or default visibility. The easiest to understand visibility level is public, because when something is public, it's visible everywhere. There's no restriction. In contrast, private visibility is the most restrictive. When a field or method is private, it's only visible within its own class. By far, public and private are the visibility levels you're going to use most often. 99% of the time, the only question to ask yourself is, should this be public or should it be private? And the general guideline is that if you can't think of a reason for something to be public, leave it private. In particular, fields generally should be private. Some even say that all fields should be private because that's consistent with the principle of encapsulation. An object in object-oriented programming is meant to be like a module where the interactions with the components of the object, the fields, are done through a limited set of methods. Occasionally, though, we know we don't want the member to be public, but private is too restrictive, and so we have default and protected. Something with default visibility is visible anywhere in the same package, and the same is true of protected members, except they are additionally visible in any subclass, whether it's in the same package or not. So, for example, if in the class cat we have a protected method named meow, then we can invoke meow anywhere in the same package, as well as in any subclass of cat, even those not in the same package. The thinking behind protected is that a descendant class has a special relationship with its ancestor, and therefore it may be reasonable for that descendant to see more of its ancestors' inner workings. In truth, members are very rarely made protected, and they're virtually never made default. In fact, it's arguable that there shouldn't be a default visibility level at all. The real reason for its inclusion in the language is that when giving small examples of code, or say when teaching the language, it's nice not always having to write public or protected or private because they're quite verbose.
In all of my code examples so far, you haven't seen me use public, protected, or private because I didn't want to have to explain yet the concept of visibility. It's arguable that that's all that default visibility is really good for, keeping code examples clean and simple. The key thing to keep in mind about these visibility levels is that they exist solely to enforce the principle of encapsulation. In particular, when you're using code written by someone else, say someone else working in your team, or say code from a standard library, you shouldn't be using the things in those objects which are meant to be private. And so when such things are declared private, the compiler can stop us from misusing them. Be absolutely clear though that this visibility enforcement happens entirely at compile time. Visibility levels are entirely a compile time concept, and they have no effect whatsoever on how the program actually operates at runtime. So in fact, if you were to take any code written in Java and remove all visibility restriction, that is if you were to make everything public, it would run exactly the same. As far as the operation of programs is concerned, visibility levels are totally superfluous. We've already discussed how you can override methods in Java, but Java also allows you to overload methods. To overload a method is to create multiple versions of it within a single class. While this sounds very similar both in name and concept to overriding, it's really very different. When we overload a method, what we're really doing is just creating a totally separate method that happens to share a name. Here for example, in a class named Sean, we have four different methods all called foo. For this to be allowed, each foo has to have a unique set of parameters. That is, the number, types, and order of the parameters has to be unique. This uniqueness is important because that's how the compiler determines which overload of foo is being invoked. So here, when we invoke foo with a lamp object as the first argument and a mammal object as the second argument, it's this last overload of foo which gets invoked because it's the foo with a lamp for its first parameter and a mammal for its second. Then here, when we invoke foo with an int argument 35, this invokes the overload of foo with a single int parameter. So the key idea here is that at compile time, the compiler looks at the compile time type of the arguments and matches the call to the overload with the appropriate parameters. So if we were to create a fifth overload of foo, which also takes a single int parameter, this would create a conflict. Now when we invoke foo with an int argument, the compiler is left with an ambiguity. It doesn't know which of the two overloads is meant to be invoked here. So the compiler is going to object if you have any two methods with both the same name and the same list of parameters. Notice though that the compiler doesn't care about the names of the parameters. Only their types, their number, and their order is what matters. Also notice the compiler doesn't care what the return types are, so any of your overloads can return any type you want. Now you may be wondering, what's the point of overloading? You may recall from our discussion on languages the notion of polymorphism. Overriding in Java is a mechanism for runtime polymorphism. Overloading, in contrast, is a mechanism for compile time polymorphism. With overloading, we have a single name for an operation for a method which effectively changes its behavior based on the number and the types of the arguments. But because the selection of which overload is made always at compile time, in truth overloading really doesn't do much for us, because instead of creating multiple methods of the same name, we could just create totally separate methods and just give them different names. So if we were really unimaginative in coming up with the names for our methods, we could have foo, foo1, foo2, foo3, and foo4. That would work perfectly fine, and you'd get the same end result. So in truth, Java allows us to overload methods merely for the sake of style. It's quite common in a class that you want multiple methods that do basically the same thing, but they take different arguments. So rather than having to give them arbitrarily different names, it's nice if we can just give them all the same name. In the end, that's all method overloading is really for. Perhaps the trickiest aspect of overloading stems from the fact that in Java, the arguments to a method don't necessarily have to exactly match in type. So here, for example, say we have an overload of foo which takes a lamp argument and then a mammal argument 
and another overload of foo which takes a lamp argument and then an animal argument. The question then arises, if we invoke foo with first a lamp argument and then a hamster, which of those two overloads is being invoked? Both seem like possibilities because a hamster is both a valid animal and a valid mammal, so it actually matches both of these. Well, as you might expect, the compiler will choose the closest match. And so assuming mammal is a closer ancestor to hamster than animal is, presumably the hierarchy goes from animal down to mammal down to hamster, well then this cult of foo is going to invoke the overload with mammal. This is actually a rather simple example. There are several other rules for how the compiler determines which overload is the closest match. I don't recommend you actually try to learn these rules. They really are quite involved and convoluted. In practice, if you're ever uncertain which overload is being invoked, you could just ask your IDE. Like, say, in the NetBeans IDE, if you hover your mouse over a method invocation, NetBeans will tell you exactly which overload the call invokes. Also keep in mind that you can explicitly specify an overload by using casts. So here, for example, if we cast the hamster argument to animal, then the overload being invoked is going to be the one with an animal parameter. So we actually should amend our method invocation rules one more time. The first thing that happens is that at compile time, the compiler checks for the compile time type of the object expression, and then it picks the proper overload based on the number, order, and compile time types of the arguments. One more somewhat confusing aspect of overloads is that a class can overload a method which it inherits. So here, if the class Donald inherits from Jill, and Jill defines a method foo with no arguments, well, if Donald defines its own method foo, but with an int parameter, that's not an override, that's an overload. So effectively, in Jill, you just have the single method foo, but then in Donald, you have the two overloads. You have the foo inherited from Jill with no parameters, and you have the foo with a single int parameter. If we also, in Donald, define a function foo with no parameters, then that is the override. And keep in mind, the override has to match entirely. Overloads can have different return types, but an override has to have not only the same parameter list, but also the same return type. So if in Donald we were to define a method foo with no arguments, but give it the return type char, then the compiler would reject this. If you change the return type, it's no longer a valid override, and the class Donald can't have both a method foo with no arguments that returns void, and a method foo with no arguments that returns char. We not only can overload regular methods, we can also overload constructors. So for example, in the class moose, we can have two constructors of moose, as long as they have different parameters. If we instantiate moose with a hamster argument and a rat argument, then the compiler knows this invokes the moose constructor, which takes a hamster parameter and a rat parameter. Often when a class has more than one constructor, the constructors mostly do the same thing. So it makes sense that, rather than duplicating this work, one constructor can call another. Here, the moose argument, which takes no arguments, is invoking in its first and only line the other moose constructor. Notice, though, that the syntax for this call is special. It uses the reserved word this, followed immediately by parentheses with a list of arguments. What will not work is to invoke the other moose constructor using the new operator. This is perfectly legal code, but it would create a new second moose object, which is not what we want at all. Nor should you invoke the other moose constructor by using its name. This would arguably be perfectly sensical syntax, but Java chose to use this instead, so this isn't legal code at all. So, when one overload of a constructor wants to pass part of the job off to another constructor, you invoke the special reference this like it's a function. Another thing a constructor might do is invoke one of the constructors of its parent. And this is done by invoking the reserved word super. So here in the first line of this top moose constructor, we are invoking the argumentless constructor of moose's parent. This makes sense because when you extend from another class, you still want all of the setup work that's done in that parent class to also be done for all of the children. You just want the children to do additional setup work. So, for example, if we have a hierarchy of Kate inheriting from Ted, which inherits from Jack, which inherits from Object, then when we construct a new Kate object, first the constructor of the Object class 
should do its business on the new Kate object, then the constructor of Jack should do its business, then the constructor of Ted, and then finally the constructor of Kate. Well, it turns out that Java makes sure this is always the case with a few simple rules about constructors. The first rule is that constructors are only invoked via the new operator or via the references this and super. Second, invocations of this and super are only allowed as the first line of a constructor. And third, the first line of a constructor always invokes this or super. Never both, just one or the other. So in fact, when you see a constructor that doesn't start with a call to this or super, what's really going on is that by default, it is invoking super with no arguments as its first line. Because a constructor can only invoke the other constructors of its class as the very first thing done in the constructor, then any kind of recursive invocation of the constructors would end up being infinite. So for example here, if the moose constructor with a hamster and rat parameter invokes the moose with no parameters, and the moose with no parameters in turn invokes the constructor with a hamster and rat parameter, well then, if we create a new moose object using either of these constructors, they're just going to keep going back in circles. It's going to be infinite recursion, and that's obviously not desirable. Consequently, Java has a rule that calls to this cannot be recursive, either directly recursive or indirectly recursive, as we just saw in the previous slide. Finally, the last thing to know about constructors is that if you want them to return early, you just write a plain return statement with no expression for a value. The way Java thinks about a constructor is that it doesn't actually return anything. When you create a new object with the new operator, it's the new operator which is returning the new object, not the constructor. So when you return in a constructor, you could just write return semicolon. Exceptions in Java are basically the same idea as we saw in JavaScript. Properly speaking, the term exception refers to an object which contains information about something that has gone wrong. And when a line of code goes wrong at runtime, we say that it throws an exception. What happens then is that the exception propagates up the chain of calls that got us to that point. When an exception is thrown in a method, if that exception is not handled in that method, it's going to propagate out of the method. That is, it's going to back out of the call to that method to the point where that method was called. And then the exception must be caught and handled in that method call, or else it will back out of that call in turn. And this process will happen all the way back up the call stack until we get to the first method invoked in our program. And if the exception is not caught and handled there, it will propagate out, causing the whole program to abort. If you didn't follow all that, I suggest you go back and review our discussion of exceptions in JavaScript. Recall that in JavaScript, the exception object, the object which actually conveys the information about what's gone wrong, that object can be any kind of object in JavaScript. It can, for example, simply just be a string. In contrast, Java is a bit more heavy-handed and formal. In Java, an exception object must be an instance of throwable or any descendant class thereof. The throwable class itself is a child of object, and as you might expect, it's in the package java.lang. Also in java.lang, throwable has two children, one called error and one very confusingly called exception. The distinction Java makes with these two classes is that error and its children are for any exceptions which you are really not meant to recover from. This generally includes things that might go wrong in the Java virtual machine itself. For instance, it's always possible, if generally unlikely, that the JVM is going to run out of memory. The JVM is really just one process run by your operating system, and if for whatever reason the operating system refuses to give the JVM more memory when it requests it, well, there's really nothing that the JVM or your Java code can do about it. So in such events, the JVM will throw an exception which is of type error or some descendant class thereof. In contrast, exceptions of type exception or of some subclass thereof, these types of exceptions are thrown when it is plausible that you might catch the exception and do something appropriate to cope with the situation. The classic example of such a scenario is when we deal with files. Whenever dealing with files, it's always possible that something might go wrong, 
For instance, say you are writing to a file that's on a USB thumb drive, but the user pulls out the thumb drive as it's being written to. Well, if that causes an exception to be thrown, then in our code we can catch the exception and then do something appropriate to cope with the situation, like maybe alerting the user and telling them, hey stupid, plug that thing back in. Now, very confusingly, the exception class has a child called runtime exception. And like with exceptions thrown of type error, exceptions thrown of type runtime exception aren't really meant to be handled. The difference is that error exceptions represent things which are outside of your control. They aren't really the fault of your code. There's something averse going on in the whole system or something averse going on in the JVM. Runtime exceptions, in contrast, are generally things that you've done wrong. They're basically bugs in your code. So for example, let's say we create a reference and then at some point we assign an object to it and later then invoke a method via that reference. If at runtime, when execution reaches this method call, if the reference doesn't hold an object, if it holds just null, this is an exception. It's a runtime exception. So if we wanted to intervene in this potential situation, we can catch the exception. And we do so by putting this method call in a try block with a corresponding catch, which catches exceptions of type null pointer exception. Null pointer exception is a child of runtime exception, and it's the kind of exception that Java throws in this case. So in the parentheses of the catch, we declare a null pointer exception variable. We can call it anything. Here we've just called it E. And this is the variable in the catch block, which is going to hold the exception object. So when c.meow is invoked, but c is null, a null pointer exception is thrown. It's done inside a try block, so control jumps to the catch block, which corresponds to it. And in that block, the exception object is assigned to the local variable E. The trouble with this kind of exception is that it can occur basically anywhere. We have method invocations all throughout our code, and so the question is, are we going to surround each and every one in its own try-catch? That would be absurd. Besides, when we do catch these exceptions, there isn't really a sensible thing to do in response. So the truth is, a runtime exception like this represents really just a bug, and the fix for these bugs is to change our code so they stop happening in the first place. The fact that the Java runtime detects these errors and throws exceptions that abort our programs is actually a good thing. For instance, invoking a method with no object is not something we intended to do. So from that point on, it's clear the program won't continue to behave correctly, so it shouldn't continue. So the point is that although Java allows us to catch these runtime exceptions, we just generally shouldn't. Just like generally, we don't attempt to catch and handle errors either. Java acknowledges this distinction between exceptions you basically should never catch and those you usually should. Any exception which is of type error or runtime exception or some subclass thereof, those are called unchecked exceptions. All other exceptions are checked exceptions and they are treated differently by the compiler. Say we have this method bar where we are potentially throwing an exception of type Leo and that Leo is a checked exception type. Well, because this method bar potentially throws a checked exception, the Java compiler requires us to acknowledge that. So we must add a throws clause to this method to acknowledge that it potentially throws this checked exception type Leo. Otherwise, the compiler is unhappy. The consequence of this throws clause is that in any method where we invoke bar, we either must put the call to bar in a try catch so that we can catch the Leo exceptions, or we have to in turn acknowledge that that method will potentially throw a Leo object. Again, the throws clause is used to declare that a method might have such checked exception type propagate out of itself. So when we catch and handle checked exception in a method, we don't need the throws clause because it's not possible that it's going to continue to propagate out of that method. So here now, when we catch and handle the Leo exception, bar no longer needs a throws clause. Because a single method might throw more than one type of checked exception, a throws clause can list multiple exception types separated by commas. While you have to cover all the exception types that might be thrown, you don't necessarily have to list each one. You can instead list an ancestor of that type instead of the specific type itself. So in fact, because all checked exceptions are ultimately going to inherit from exception, we can just write throws exception and that will cover everything. 
So anytime you need a throws clause, you could always just write throws exception, but the trouble then, as far as the compiler believes, that method is going to throw exception, not more specific types. So when you invoke that method, the compiler is going to require you to either catch and handle type exception, or in turn give that invoking method its own throws clause that lists exception. This basically would make a mockery of the whole idea of checked exceptions. You'd end up with all of your methods declared with a throws exception clause. The whole point of checked exceptions is that when a programmer invokes a method, they should be encouraged by the compiler to consider handling that exception rather than just blindly ignoring it. And so the compiler nags us and requires us to at least acknowledge that there's a potential exception that we're not catching here. That's the idea behind checked exceptions, and it's actually one of the more controversial ideas in Java. A lot of people consider it just a mistake. They think all exceptions should be unchecked. In fact, Java is the only language with checked exceptions. No other language forces programmers to acknowledge where certain exceptions might occur. Like in C, an array in Java is a fixed size, homogeneous collection. That is, the number of members in an array is fixed, it doesn't change once you create the array, and all of these members are of the same type. From there though, the similarities with C end. Because whereas an array in C is something which is always allocated on the stack, in Java an array is just another kind of object, it's something that goes on the heap. Furthermore, what that object is made up of is really just references, not actual other objects. So for example, say we have an apple array of size 4. Well that object is somewhere on the stack and it consists of four references of type apple. And when that object is created, each of those references start out null, but we can assign apple objects to them. And in fact, just like references which are fields or local variables, these references can be assigned any object which qualifies as that type, which qualifies in this case as an apple. So for example, if Fuji is a descendant of apple, then we can assign Fuji objects to these Apple references. Like classes and interfaces, arrays are reference types. So when we create a local variable m of type mammal array, then m is a reference. To then create an actual mammal array object, we use the new operator, but instead of putting parentheses after the class name, we put the subscript operators, the square brackets, and inside we put the size of the array. So here we are creating a new mammal array with three elements and assigning it to M. To then get at the individual elements of the array, we use the subscript operator, very much like it looks in C. In C though, you may recall, the subscript operator is really just syntactical magic that stands in for a dereference with pointer arithmetic. Well, in Java we have no notion of dereferencing and pointer arithmetic, so that's not what's going on. It's simply, we are getting at here the element at index 2 of the mammal array. And of course, arrays are indexed starting from zero, so index two is actually the last element in this three element array. So in this line, we're creating a new mammal object and assigning it to the last slot of the array. And again, because the mammal array is an object that consists of three mammal references, those references can point to any object which is a valid mammal. So assuming a cat object is a valid kind of mammal, we can assign a cat to the first slot in this array. Finally, every array object has an int field called length, which is the size of the array. So m.length here returns the int value 3. Now the key idea with arrays is that for every type we have, there is a corresponding array type. So if our class hierarchy looks like this, we have a parallel hierarchy which looks the same except all the types are arrays. And the importance of this is that if, say, Natalie is a subtype of Jerry, then a Natalie array is considered a subtype of Jerry array. Also, the object array at the top of this parallel hierarchy itself is considered a subtype of object. So effectively, every array type is considered a subtype of object. So the consequence of this is that we can assign a cat array object to not just a cat array reference, but also to a mammal array reference, assuming mammal is an ancestor of cat. And then also we can assign the same object to an object array reference, and then also to just a plain old object reference. Implicitly in these cases, we are upcasting. 
when you assign C to M, we have to upcast from cat array to mammal array. And when we assign C to O1, we have to upcast from cat array to object array. But we don't have to explicitly write these casts. The compiler will just assume they are there. However, when we take our object reference, which we know is actually holding a cat array object, we have to explicitly use a downcast to assign its value back to an actual cat array reference. When we do assign, say, a cat array object to a mammal array reference, the important thing to keep in mind, though, is that the cat array object is still an array of cat references. But when we get at the slots via a mammal array reference, the Java compiler is going to see this as type mammal, so it's going to allow us to assign to it a mammal object. What happens then at runtime anytime we assign to an array is a type check. And so when the runtime sees we're attempting to assign a mammal to a cat reference, which is not proper, a mammal is not a type of cat, the runtime will throw an exception. Specifically, it throws a runtime exception called array store exception. To avoid these exceptions, you need to be careful with your logic and keep track of which types of arrays are actually going to be assigned to references. The all-important idea here is that the compiler only sees the compile time type of an array reference. It doesn't know what actually is going to be stored in it. So in this example, when we assign a cat array to a mammal array reference, and then assign a cat to the first index of the array, well, so far the compiler is happy, because even though what is really a cat array the compiler sees as a mammal array, the compiler won't object because a cat is a valid kind of mammal. However, when we try and get that cat object from the array and assign it to a cat reference, the compiler objects because the compile time type of a subscript of M is mammal, and a mammal isn't a valid kind of cat. The workaround here is to simply downcast from moose to cat. This makes the compiler happy, and when this executes, the runtime will do a type check to make sure that what gets returned here really is a cat object. Now, in addition to regular single-dimension arrays, we also in Java have two-dimensional arrays. So given our regular class hierarchy, we have another parallel hierarchy of two-dimensional array types. So for example, if we have a class Wyatt, then there is a corresponding Wyatt two-dimensional array type. A two-dimensional array object actually looks very similar to a single-dimension array object. Whereas, say, a single-dimension Apple array object is made up of Apple references, a two-dimensional Apple array object is made up of Apple array references. It is effectively an array of Apple arrays. And so to its references, we assign any object which is a valid kind of Apple array. So either Apple array objects or any objects which are descendants thereof, like, say, Fuji array objects. Here's an example of what such arrays look like in code. First, we're declaring a cat two-dimensional array reference called C, and we're assigning to it a new two-dimensional cat array object, and the size of that array is 3. Notice that the size of the array is specified in the first set of square brackets. Once we have our array of cat arrays, we can assign to it cat array objects. Here we create a new cat array with five elements, and then assign it to index 1 of our two-dimensional array. So the reference C here points to an array made up of three slots, and the second of those slots points to an array with five slots for cat objects. If we then assign a cat to index 0 of index 1 of C, that object is assigned to the first slot of the array in the second slot of our two-dimensional array. This syntax can be a bit confusing. You really should learn to think of the subscript as like an operator. It's just unusual because we don't leave any space between it and its operands, and it surrounds the second operand, the index but you will get used to it with a bit of practice. Now, not only do we have two-dimensional arrays in Java, we actually have arrays of any number of dimensions. So say, for every regular type we have, there is a corresponding three-dimensional array type. A three-dimensional array object is effectively an array of two-dimensional arrays, 
So say, a three-dimensional apple array object consists of references to two-dimensional apple arrays. So the general rule is that when you have an array of n dimensions, then it consists of references to arrays of n minus one dimensions. So say, a 16-dimension array would consist of references to 15-dimension arrays. Now, of course, in practice, whereas single-dimension arrays are very common, two-dimensional arrays are used quite commonly, and three-dimensional arrays at least are used occasionally, arrays of about four or more dimensions are almost never heard of. If you find yourself using arrays with many dimensions, you've probably done something wrong. In any case, whenever dealing with an array, keep in mind that no matter how many dimensions it has, it ultimately is a descendant of regular object. This makes sense and is occasionally useful because sometimes you want a reference which can hold any object whatsoever, and a reference of type object can do just that. For every primitive type, Java has a corresponding array type, and these arrays are just like any other except for one important difference. A single dimension array of primitives does not consist of references, it consists of values themselves. So for example, the slots of a single dimension int array all hold int values, not references. However, a multi-dimensional array of primitives consists of references because it's an array of other arrays, and arrays are always objects. So for example, a two-dimensional array of ints consists of references to single-dimensional arrays of ints. So the important thing to take away is that single-dimensional arrays of primitives are special. They hold values themselves, not references. The other important thing to understand about primitive arrays is that all primitive array types inherit directly from object. And this is the case for any number of dimensions. So say, a three-dimensional char array is considered a direct child of object. So when you have an array of primitives, the only other type you can cast it to is the type object. So finally, 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 we can look at how to write Hello World in Java. So first off, if we want to start a program in Java, we launch the Java VM, and when we do so, we specify one class. This class must be public, and it must have a method called main, which returns void, has a string array parameter, and is declared public and static. This is the method which gets first invoked when our program runs. Otherwise, it's just a normal static method, and so we can call it wherever we like. The reason it has a string array parameter is that when you launch the JVM from the command line and you specify a class, after that you can write whatever text you want, and that text gets passed to main. It gets split up into individual strings by spaces, and each one of those strings goes into the string array. Here, we've given the string array parameter the name args. We could have named it anything we want, but calling it args is the most common convention. Args here is short for arguments, as in the text on the command line becomes the arguments to our program. Also, I chose to name the class Hello World, but we could have named it anything we want. In any case, inside the method we have this one single statement. System here is a class. It's a class in the package java.lang. That's why we don't have to import it. And the system class contains a static field called out. Out is an instance of another class in the standard library called printStream. This particular printStream instance represents standard output, and so when we invoke its printLine method with a string argument, that string gets printed out to standard output. It's called printLN because LN stands for line, and after it prints the string it's also going to insert a new line character. So, this statement is going to print to the console the text hello comma space world exclamation mark and then a new line character. After that, the main method finishes executing, it returns, and that's the end of our program. So, we've covered all the really big ideas in Java and the most essential features, but in our other units on Java, we're going to pick up the remaining pieces, and that includes some features like inner classes, generics, abstract classes, wrapper classes, enumerations, annotations, and the reserved words assert and final. Aside from these, we'll pick up the remaining odds and ends of the language, and also we'll go into much more detail about the standard library. Even once you become familiar and comfortable with all this stuff, it can still be a bit mystifying about how one should write their code in Java, and so we'll have another unit on object-oriented design.